good morning and good afternoon, everyone. So I am going to cover some recent updates in chronic myeloid leukemia and myeloid proliferative neoplasms. For this, I used uh, papers that were recently published in the past year that I thought were quite impactful, as well as updates from ASH and one update from ASCO in chronic myeloid leukemia. So with regard to chronic myeloid leukemia, the uh, hot topics in our field include stopping TKI therapy, who's eligible, who succeeds, and how you can qualify to stop therapy. Additionally, I'd like to provide some new updates for generic imatinib and panatinib, the third generation TKI used mostly in the third line and beyond that treats the T315I mutation. I'd also like to provide a new, some therapeutic overview on two new drugs that may or may not be FDA approved in the near future. So with regard to why we can stop CML therapy, some of you may be puzzled how it's possible that patients who still have low burden of detectable disease may actually succeed at stopping TKI therapy. So there are a couple of theories, and one of these theories includes CML stem cell eradication. Earlier work, in particular from Tessa Holyoke's lab, has shown us that the CML stem cell compartment, which is quiescent, is resistant to TKI therapy. However, over time, cells will enter into the progenitor cell compartment, go into cell cycle, and then be able to be targeted by TKI therapy. So this can lead to a slow eradication of CML stem cells over time on continued TKI therapy. And this also partly explains why longer treatment with TKI is associated with a better success rate when you stop TKI. However, that's not the whole story. We also believe that immunological control helps sustain treatment remission. In work that has come from many labs, including the labs of Agnes Young in Australia, we know that patients with deep molecular responses have a different immune environment as compared to patients at diagnosis. They have increased immune activators and surveillance and decreased immune suppressors. It's quite possible based on presentations at ASH in 2019 that we will be able to identify an immune cell signature that will better predict who can stop TKI and succeed at TKI cessation. There's a very large body of work uh, stemming back over the past decade and earlier including the French STOP Imatinib 1, STEM 2, and the Australian Twister study, and the French STOP 2G study that have shown a very consistent rate of treatment-free remission, about 45 to 50%. We currently define treatment-free remission as a BCR able of less than 0.1% that remains lower than that value while off therapy. Additionally, this work has also shown that if patients who meet these criteria Restart therapy, MMR is achieved typically within four months. These patients are very carefully selected, generally on TKI therapy for three years or longer, with deep molecular responses of one to two years, typically two years. The data that I show here in the graph at the right are results from the Inest Freedom study, which was a study that stopped nilotinib in the first line, and at 48 weeks, treatment-free survival was 53% and at 144 weeks was 48.7%. At the end of last year, the DAS-free study was published. Uh, this was a study that stopped dasatinib in the first and second line. This was a study of 84 patients who had been on dasatinib for at least two years you had to have a desatinib-induced deep molecular response, which for this particular study was defined as a BCR able of less than 0.0032% uh, at the central lab. And if you pass that hurdle, you could then discontinue discontinue desatinib. The study reported a treatment-free remission at two years of 51% on first-line desatinib and 44% for resistant patients and 44% for intolerant patients. And these were patients who had switched to desatinib for either resistance or intolerance. Now, the NEST STOP study was a study that stopped nilotinib in the second line. And if we compare those data informally between the NEST Freedom study and the NEST STOP study, there wasn't really a difference in TFR rates for patients who stopped for resistance intolerance or were treated first line. 
However, these data are probably more in keeping with updates from the STOP2G study, which was the study from France, which allowed patients on desatinib and lotinib, including resistant and intolerant patients. If you were a true resistant patient, your 60-month TFR rate was 29.8% compared to 63.6% .6 for somebody who had no such history. Just accepted for publication is the U.S. Life After Stopping TKI study, which many of us participated in. For this study, there were 172 patients at 14 U.S. sites. We did not specify that you had to be on a particular TKI. You could be on the lotnib, desatinib, bisutinib, or imatinib. But you weren't allowed on if you had true resistance. You were allowed to switch for intolerance. At three years, our treatment-free remission rate was quite comparable to the other studies at 62%. What was unique about this study is that this was the first study to prospectively assess patient-reported outcomes after stopping and restarting TKIs. And what you can see here at the figure at left is that we saw significant improvements in fatigue, depression, and sleep, as well as GI symptoms once you were off therapy. What we didn't see an improvement in is in pain scores, and this has to do with the withdrawal syndrome that 25 to 30% of patients will get. Molecular relapse occurred most frequently within the first six to 12 months, but I include some of our data here for the rare late relapses, which highlight why continued monitoring indefinitely is really critical. We saw 10.2% relapses between one to two years, 5.1% of our relapses between 24 to 36 months, and 3.4% after 36 months. What factors are associated with success at treatment-free remission? Well, the ongoing Euro ski study is the largest study of its kind, uh, which has presented interim data at ASH and in publication. We know that the longer that you are in TKI use, typically longer than five years, the better treatment-free remission rates are. Additionally, the longer your period of deep molecular response for this particular study, each additional year of a deep molecular response beats your able less than 0.01%. Your odds of remaining in major molecular response by six months increase by 13%. What was not reported as showing a difference was the depth of response, and so our studies have had slightly different entry criteria, less than 0.01%, less than 0.0325, and even lower, but we did not, we have not found a difference due to that depth. So we also know that even though in front of CML, BCR ABLE is the main driver of disease, there are other pathways that contribute to CML. And consequently, there are a number of studies ongoing looking at strategies to combat resistance, eradicate CML stem cells, and to treat advanced disease. Additionally, strategies to promote deep response, improve TFR rates, and allow a second TFR. And some of this ongoing work, which I won't present here, includes interferon in Europe with the TIGER, PEDALS, and ENDURE study. Here in the U.S. at the SCCA, we have opened a study where we add ruxolitinib onto a TKI backbone in order to promote deep molecular response that will allow a TFR attempt. There's an interesting approach that was recently published actually in two publications, first in 2017 and then in 2019, and this is the UK DESTINY study. This was a study of 174 patients treated with imatinib, desatinib, and nilotinib. Medium time on drug was about seven years. To be eligible for the study, you had to have a major molecular response, less than 0.1%, or MR4, less than 0.01%. If you had that response durably for a year, you were permitted then to decrease your TKI dose by 50%. If you maintained that response for a year, you were then eligible to stop. Now, generally, if you had an MR, only 19% of patients had to re-escalate their dose. If you had a deeper response, only two, uh, only three patients or 2% had to re-escalate. Dose de-escalation resulted in improvement in adverse events, and anybody who had to go to full dose was able to get to MMR again after about four months. What was particularly intriguing about this DESTINY study is the success rate that they reported for patients who entered the TFR phase. Now, that red line at the top is the MR4 group, and at 36 months, they reported a TFR rate of 72%, which is higher than what's been previously reported. Now, I don't know if this is a numbers game or if this really reflects something about a dose de-escalation followed by stopping, so stay tuned. 
What we did also show here with the major molecular response group is we don't really encourage stopping those patients. CFR was only 36% in that group, and NCCN and European Leukemia Net do not recommend stopping. An area of interest is starting lower doses, and this was a paper published by Nakbe and colleagues from MD Anderson earlier this year in 2020. This was a pilot study of 81 patients, and these patients started first-line desatinib at 50 milligrams orally daily. So if you look at the 12-month responses there, you can see that 81% of patients achieved MMR, and 59% of patients achieved deeper responses. So these are quite interesting results. They felt here that patients were able to continue on therapy, and there were fewer dose interruptions, and this may play into this. Additionally, now with desatinib, that, the increase, that is associated with an increase in pleural effusion, it is possible, though we don't know yet, that a lower dose such as 50 could result in a lower incidence of pleural effusion. Only 6% have been reported so far. Now, I will say that in my over 60 crowd, this is the dose that I use when I use desatinib. So how about switching from branded generic uh, to branded generic? We don't have data yet for first-line generic, but there have been several very recent publications. I'm showing here an Italian study of 200 patients. Now, I will point out that most of these patients had a deep molecular response, MR4, MR4.5, before the switch. But as you can see here, after the switch, most remained stable, 69%, improved 25%, and worsening was only seen in 5.5% of the patients. We will find that there are different side effects, and this is probably due to the different excipients in the different preparations of generic versus Novartis, the uh, uh, Gleevec product. But what the Italian group did report was that there was actually an improvement in cramps, edema, fatigue, and diarrhea with generic imatinib versus uh, Gleevec. For the last part of the CML section here, I'm going to talk about some new drugs or updates for panatinib. So I'd like to put this into perspective. So panatinib is currently used for the most part in the third line for the T315I mutated uh, oh. I know, yeah. So what this meta-analysis shows here is what happens to patients who have failed imatinib and failed a second generation TKI and then switch to a second, uh, second generation TKI or panatinib. What you see here is if I switch a patient to a second generation TKI in the third line, that the CCYR rate, which is equivalent to BCR of less than 1%, is about 20 to 25%. It, this compares to about 50 to 60% with panatinib, and is why we were so enthusiastic about this dose, because this can be a very hard-to-treat group of patients. However, as you can see in the box at right, eclusic is associated with a high, high rate of cardiovascular events, which have been reported as up to 35% from Phase one and Phase two studies. So given this background, the purpose of the OPTIC trial was to find the safest, most effective dose for panatinib, and these data were presented by Jorge Cortez in interim format at this year's ASCO meeting. Patients were either resistant or intolerant of two or more TKIs or had the T315I mutation. They were then randomized to one of three doses, 45, 30, and 15 milligrams. The primary endpoint was BCR able of less than 1%, which is equivalent to a CCYR at 12 months. As you can see here, 38.7% of patients on the 45 milligram dose achieved MMR at 12 months versus 27.4 in the 30 and 26.5 in the 15 milligram dose. If we look at the cumulative incidence of BCR able of less than or equal to 1%, you can see with the green line, that more patients achieved this response on the 45 milligram dose. At this point, there is no difference between progression free and overall survival between the arms. PFS follow-up, though, is, is quite short. With regard specifically to this question of treatment adver uh, emergent adverse occlusive events, which we call TEAOE, if we graph these here versus response, you can see that the 45 milligram dose that uh, almost 50% of patients were able to achieve this response. We can also see that about 10% of these had arterial vascular events, which is 
somewhat lower than what's been reported from the phase one and phase two study. And surely there was a dose response here. But at this time, we're really not clear on the risk and benefit. However, the conclusions were maximum rates of BCR of less than 1% were achieved at the 45 milligram dose. And I should also point out that when you dose reduced to 15 milligrams, typically after three months, that these were durable. Additionally, we will need further analysis to provide a refined understanding of the risk to benefit. I, in my own practice, have typically been using a lower dose of 30 milligrams because of tolerability issues. But the data have been somewhat eye-opening for this very difficult to treat group of patients who are truly resistant to multiple TKIs. Asimitib is a drug that may shortly result in FDA approval. I'm not sure when. This is uh, also called ABLE001. This is an allosteric inhibitor of BCR ABLE, and it binds to a different part of the BCR ABLE protein. It's highly selective, has a narrow target profile, and is active against BCR ABLE mutations that confer resistance to other TKIs. The ABLE 001 X2101 study is a very large study with many arms, but I'm only going to focus on the chronic phase and accelerated phase patients that were just reported in a New England Journal of Medicine article earlier this year. These were patients who were relapsed or refractory to at least two different TKIs and patients who had the T315I mutation. The primary outcome was MTT-RDE. I'm showing here only a snapshot of the chronic phase patients who did not have the T315I mutation in this study. Uh, and as you can see here, 70% or 77 of 110 achieved a complete cytogenetic response. By six months, 37% had achieved a major molecular response. And by 12 months, 48% had achieved a major molecular response. Most common all-grade adverse events were fatigue, headache, increased blood pace, nausea, arthralgias, diarrhea, rash, and thrombocytopenia. And the most common grade 3, 4 AEs were increased blood pace, hypertension, and thrombocytopenia. Another drug that has just entered clinical trial here in the U.S., including at the SCCA, is HQP1351. This is another tyrosine kinase inhibitor, but it does have activity against T315I mutated CML. These data, which were presented in oral format at the ASH meeting in 2019, included 101 CML patients, 87 in chronic phase, and 14 in accelerated phase. These patients were primarily treated in the third line and beyond. If you look at the graph at right, you can see that 61% of the chronic phase patients achieved complete cytogenetic response, and 37% achieved a major molecular response. Additionally, the T315I mutated patients had even higher response rates, likely because they were also treated earlier in their treatment course. The most common non-hematologic adverse events were hypertriglyceridemia, transaminitis, proteinuria, hyperbilirubinemia, and the most common hematologic treatment-related adverse event was grade 3, 4 thrombocytopenia. You may wonder how we stand with CML patients and SARS-CoV-2. The largest group of patients analyzed has just come from Italy. This looked at 6,883 CML patients. Among this group, only 12 cases of confirmed COVID-19 were reported. There were only two deaths, and these were in patients over the ages of 90. Consequently, the authors concluded that the incidence of COVID-19 infection has so far proven to be extremely low in CML patients treated with TKIs. These data are not dissimilar from what was recently also reported from a study in the Netherlands. In Turkey, they did a case control study of a small group of patients, and although these data are not statistically significant, it was interesting to see that they noted shorter hospital stays and a lower case fatality rate among COVID-19 patients. And so consequently, we think in patients with chronic phase who are well-treated for CML that there likely isn't a risk because of the disease. Going to switch gears here now and focus for the remainder of my talk on myeloproliferative neoplasm. I'm going to give you some updates on sidratinib and progretinib, and I'm also very briefly going to give you some therapeutic updates on strategies under evaluation in myelofibrosis. So, as you all know, sidratinib was approved in 2019 for intermediate to high risk myelofibrosis patients that are secondary or primary. 
And these data were based on the Jakarta study primarily. Uh, this afidratinib is a uh, more specific JAK2 inhibitor, also targets split 3. The Jakarta study was a phase 3 study. It was a randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled study and JAK inhibitor naive study. Data also for fidratinib come from the Jakarta 2 study, which was a single arm study in prior treated patients who had received rexidinib with fidratinib at 400 milligrams daily. The Jakarta study also included patients with platelet counts above 50,000, and the primary endpoint, like many of our studies for myelofibrosis, was spleen volume reduction of equal to or more than 35%. So this primary endpoint was achieved by 35 of 96 patients, 36% um, in the 400 milligram arm versus only one of 96 or 1% in the placebo group. The median duration of spleen response was 18.2 months. Additionally, patients had an improvement in the secondary endpoint, which was total symptom score. We know that development was initially discontinued due to Wernicke's encephalopathy. Consequently, we like to assess thiamine levels in all patients prior to starting, periodically during treatment, and clinically as indicated. Dr. Claire Harrison presented a reanalysis of the Jakarta and Jakarta 2 data at ASH in 2019. And the idea here was to look specifically at that hard to treat group of patients with lower platelets between 50 to 100,000. We know that this is an important question because patients with thrombocytopenia at baseline do worse overall and also during JAK2 inhibitor therapy. What they found, as you can see, was no statistically significant difference in spleen volume responses or symptom responses if you had a baseline platelet between 50 to 100,000 or higher platelet count. Their conclusions were that fibrotin was generally well tolerated regardless of platelet count. I'm not showing these data here, but they said something similar for the Jakarta 2 patients who had been previously treated with ruxolitinib. But I do highlight here in the red box that these patients who were previously treated with ruxolitinib are a tough group and that 49% of these patients on this Jakarta 2 study developed grade 3 to 4 from cytopenia. Currently, we are very interested in results that are coming out of the Pritnip study, uh, PAC203, which I'm going to present here very briefly. We saw promising results from PERSIST 1 and 2, including in patients with low platelet counts of less than 50,000. However, there was an FDA hold due to higher death rates from intracranial hemorrhage, heart failure, and cardiac arrest. Consequently, the PAC203 study was a dose binding study to find the most effective dose with the best safety profile. Dr. Aaron Gerds presented these data at ASH in 2019, which are updated results of the PAC203 study. Key eligibility criteria were patients who were intolerant of ruxolitinib or had not benefited from ruxolitinib. They were then randomized one to one to one to 200 twice daily, 100 twice daily, or 100 daily. The primary endpoint was safety and efficacy across the different arms. I showed this slide here to just show that this was a group of patients with low platelet counts. This was the median platelet count across all studies and was 55,000. With regard to spleen volume responses, the best outcomes were seen in patients at the 200 milligram twice daily, including in patients who had platelet count less than 50,000. Additionally, with regard to total symptom score improvements, these were also most improved in patients at 200 milligrams twice daily. With regard to platelet count stability, I'm showing the platelet count for patients who are less than 50 at baseline over time, and you can see that there was not much of a difference in any of the treatment arms as patients were treated. With regard to the important TAAE of hemorrhage and cardiac events, what I show here are the grade 3, 4, 5 hemorrhagic events and the grade 3, 4, 5 cardiac events that were reported on PAC-203 as well as on the PERSIST study. For bleeding, grade 3 and above, this was 7.5%. There was grade 3 cardiac event, 3.7%. These are not dissimilar from PERSIST and may actually be a little bit better. So the conclusions here 
was that a good relationship was clearly observed with the efficacy being best for 200 milligrams twice daily. Responses were best in the 200 milligram BID arm, particularly in patients with severe thrombocytopenia, and the drug was considered well tolerated with no excess of high-grade cardiac or bleeding AEs. Consequently, the 200 milligram BID dose is now under evaluation in the Pacifica study, including at the SCCA with Bart Scott as the PI. These are patients with severe thrombocytopenia, less than 50,000, and patients are randomized to bacritinib or physician choice. Aaron Gertz also presented a base for loose patercept uh, associated anemia. And as many of us know, an MDS, an MDS RST, loose patercept was very recently approved in April of 2020 for anemia. Loose patercept is a first in class erythroid maturation agent that binds to several TGF beta superfamily ligands. It diminishes MAD23 signaling and ultimately enhances late stage erythropoiesis. This was a group of patients uh, with primary or secondary uh, myelofibrosis. They were anemia either red blood cell transfusion dependent or not requiring um, transfusions. There were 76 patients that were evaluable. The study had multiple cohorts for transfusion or no transfusion, also patients who received ruxolitinib or did not receive ruxolitinib. They received loose patercept at one milligram per kilogram, which could be escalated to 1.75 milligrams per kilogram as needed. The primary endpoint for patients who did not need to be transfusion was a hemoglobin increase of equal to or more than 1.5 grams per deciliter. If you were transfusion dependent, you needed to be RBC transfusion independent for 12 or more weeks. With regard to the primary endpoint, if you look at the red arrows that I've put on this graph, you will see that the patients who had the best response were actually the patients who were receiving concurrent ruxolitinib. So that was 20% for cohort 3A and 32% for 3B. So in summary, the, the initial results do show some clinical activity and MF-associated anemia. It improved anemia in those patients receiving and not receiving RBC transfusion, but the effects were clearly more evident in patients treated with ruxolitinib. Adverse events were mostly grade one to grade two, which were not different from studies in MDS and in beta thalassemia. So to set up for my final slides on a, a couple of new agents under study, you may wonder why JEC2 inhibitors are not disease modifying, probably because there are other mutations that are important in the disease. We also think it may be due to inadequate drug exposure. More optimal inhibition may not be possible because of other on-target toxicities. There are more potent type 2 inhibitors that have been designed that bind to the inactive conformation, but these are likely too toxic for use in patients. We also know that you can develop a JAK2 mutation-specific drug, but this has not yet been successful. There are also escape pathways for the JAK2 inhibitors we use through heterodimeric JAK stat activation. What happens is you get persistent MPN cells that remain that are not inhibited, even though JAK2 inhibition is ongoing. There have been a lot of drugs and pathways that have been tested in myelofibrosis, and very briefly, these have included combinations with ruxolitinib, such as pegylated interferon and IMIDs. The problem has been cytopenias and tolerance issues. There's been some interesting data that has emerged with hypomethylating agents in terms of spleen reduction and decreased JAK2 allele burden. We've also tested HIV inhibitors and HSP90 inhibitors, but treatment side effects resulted in frequent discontinuation, and some of these studies have also been terminated early. PI3 kinase inhibitors have also been looked at. Uh, Harmony studied buparlisib, but no further development was pursued. Umbralisib is still undergoing clinical trial evaluation. Others that are still ongoing include MDM P53 interaction inhibitors and an apoptotic inhibitor, LCL161, which I'll briefly present. Additionally, epigenetic targets are being studied. These include CPI0610 and an LSD inhibitor as well. With regard to a middle step, which was a is a telomerase inhibitor, very promising updates were shown at ASH in 2018, but then development was discontinued but Geron may be revisiting this in a new study for MF.
So two updates. There were final results given at ASH for LCL161, which is a second mitochondrial activator of caspases. But ultimately, this promotes apoptosis and also induces tumor necrosis factor, which then simultaneously sensitizes cell for TNS-induced death. Primary endpoint here was overall response. This was reported at 30% overall. With study follow-up of 22 months, overall survival has not yet been reached. The next steps here are how to combine this agent uh, with other drugs. John Mascarenas uh, published uh, and presented results of CPI0610, which is a BET inhibitor. This is an epigenetic approach that ultimately preferentially targets transcription of key cancer cells. This then reduces inflammation and reduces uh, NPN cells in the bone marrow that drive myelofibrosis. They have reported some interesting results in combination with ruxolitinib, uh, where most of their responses were seen. And consequently, they've now amended this study to expand the transfusion-dependent ruxolitinib CPI0610 cohort and are also adding a treatment-naive combination arm as well. At ASCO, updates for a phase one study of 9-ING41, which is a TGF beta inhibitor, were presented. It turns out that targeting uh, GSK3 beta also has antifibrotic effects, and so a phase one study is opening nationally in MF, including at the SCCA. My last slide here is just to say that just Recently, the very first guideline on myeloid lymphoid neoplasms and eosinophilia and tyrosine kinase fusions has just been published. And so if you need some guidance on this small group but important group of patients, please refer to this new guideline that has just been published last month. In conclusion, uh, I'd like to shout out to Anna Halper here on the call with us, as well as Bart Scott. These are a list of the clinical trials that we together have at the SCCA and CML and MPNs, please don't hesitate to contact me at my email with any questions. And I'd like to thank you so much for your attention today on a Saturday. Um, I'm happy to take any questions, Vinay and Shalender. Thank you so much, Vivian. This is, it's, it's mind boggling to see all this progress. Uh, uh, it's so many trials going on, so many new molecular targets, and uh, it, it's uh, really great for the patient.